Good morning, everyone. We're so excited that you all took the time to join us today. Uh, I think we have a pretty great presentation laid out for you. As Kyle said, my name's Jenna Franks. I'm one of the attorneys at the office. I work primarily out of our state college location. Um, I work with Kristen, who's a certified Medicaid planner and a long-term care planner. And also on today's call is Holly Ray. She's a specialized care planner. Um, right now, her job is mainly kind of focusing on more of our clients that um, have more of a, a, a dementia diagnosis and kind of helping through those types of conditions. Um, and together, we really hope to make sure we're taking care of all your legal needs, but also benefits based needs and you're meeting, we're meeting all of your care needs as well, you know, whatever those might be. Um, Kristen, I'll let you go ahead and kind of give a little bit of your background too, if you want. Sure. Thanks, Jenna. Um, my name is Kristen. I am a long-term care planner and a certified Medicaid planner, as Jenna mentioned. I am also a certified dementia practitioner. Um, I work alongside Jenna at the firm to make sure that we're accomplishing all the planning um, and benefits aspects of this. Um, I actually used to work for the Area Agency on Aging, and I know there's quite a few representatives from local aging offices here. So I used to um, be right there with you, um, going into individuals' homes and working with the waiver program. So today we have a lot of information to share. So we're gonna jump right in. Please keep a list of any questions or type them in the chat box, and we will definitely make sure to answer all of those before, before we're done today. I also do want to mention, to keep in mind, we do offer free initial consultations at our office. So if you start thinking about things today um, and you're like, wow, I really need to talk to somebody, it's a free consultation. So there's no obligation, come and talk with us. We're doing everything via Zoom and um, phone calls right now, of course, with the pandemic, but we're here to be able to answer your questions about your specific situation. So um, with the holiday season, we are looking at our greatest gift. So what is the greatest gift that you can provide for your loved ones this holiday season? Peace of mind and protection. So we're gonna talk about what you can do to provide peace of mind and protection for your loved ones. Peace of mind really starts with good legal documents. So there's a lot of different legal documents that you could have. Um, and we're gonna break it down this morning, how each of these documents work and why they're really important to have in place. But before we jump into those legal documents, also really important to have a plan in place. You need to make sure if you have accounts with beneficiaries like IRAs, life insurance, they have good beneficiary designations on them. We'll talk a little bit more about that this morning as well. But going into this, having a plan is the best thing you can do for yourself and your family. If you don't have a plan and you have a healthcare crisis, somebody else has to put a plan in place for you. And it might not be the plan that you wanted. You don't have the control over what that looks like. And it could also be a burdensome for your family members to have to jump in and be guessing at what you, you would have wanted if you could say that at that time. So let's jump in and I'm gonna turn it over to Jenna and she's going to talk about those really important legal documents that everybody needs. Thanks, Kristen. So the most important estate planning document that everybody should have is the power of attorney. A power of attorney is just a written legal document where you actually appoint somebody else to be able to make decisions on your behalf. This could be regarding finances, this could be um, healthcare decisions, um, and really that looks like four documents at our office. But first, why is the power of attorney the most important estate planning document? Well, first of all, believe it or not, your spouse cannot automatically step in and make financial decisions on your behalf. In fact, the state of Pennsylvania assumes that you don't want your spouse to be making financial decisions for you. I don't know if any of you have ever uh, just tried calling the cable company and it's in your spouse's name. Chances are they won't talk to you. So when we're talking about accounts that actually have money in them, they're definitely not going to talk to you if your name's not on that account. But let's just say, uh, something happens where you're not able to make your own decisions and you don't have a power of attorney in advance. 
well, then your loved ones are going to have to seek what's called a guardianship. They're going to have to go and ask the judge to appoint someone as the guardian over you so that financial and healthcare decisions can be made. And this is not typically the route we like to go for several reasons. First of all, it's expensive. It's expensive to go through the guardianship process. Um, typically, a couple thousand dollars is what we're talking about. It's time consuming because anytime you deal with the court system, it, it's going to take time. On average, it takes about three months for a simple guardianship to take place. And lastly, it's just an intrusive process. You know, there, there are court records. You have to um, get uh, medical opinions as far as what the incapacitated person's condition is like. And, and it's nobody really likes to go through that. So it's much cheaper, it's much easier to make these decisions yourself. And at the end of the day, through the guardianship process, the judge is making the decision who will be making decisions for you. Um, it may or may not be somebody that you would have appointed yourself. So make those decisions ahead of time for yourself and put a power of attorney document in place. I mentioned before that we typically put four powers of attorney in place for each client. There's the financial health care or financial financial power of attorney, the health care power of attorney, the mental health power of attorney, and the living will. And we're going to go through each of these and kind of just give you a breakdown on which what each document covers. The financial power of attorney is just as it sounds. This is authorizing somebody else to deal with anything financial or asset wise on your behalf. So this could be the day to day you know, paying of bills and signing off on your checks to pay those bills. This could be talking to your bank account holders or accessing those bank accounts. This also deals with any accounts like life insurance, retirement accounts, um, investment accounts, anything like that. Um, and an average financial power of attorney allows your agent to be able to make limited gifts and create a revocable trust. Now, there's a couple things, though, that Kristen and I, when we review your documents that we're looking for, and I'll tell you, in 90%, at least, of the documents that we see, the, the correct language is not in there. So if you guys get nothing else out of this presentation, if you have a financial power of attorney in place, check and see if this language is in there, because it's so important that it is in there. So you want your power of attorney to allow the person to make unlimited gifts. The biggest reason for that is because... The bulk of what Kristen and I do is planning for long-term care, okay? And a lot of that is moving money around, whether it's from spouse to spouse, from you to your children, from you to a trust, but it's moving money around so that we can get you qualified for Medicaid benefits if you should need those, okay? But when you're moving money around from yourself to somebody else or to a trust, it's considered gifting. And if your power of attorney only allows for limited gifts, then we can only move up to $15,000 out of your name, even if that's even to your spouse. So let's say a, a big planning strategy that Kristen and I use is to move the house that you own from both spouses to the spouse that doesn't need care. Well, if your power of attorney only allows for limited gifting and you don't have capacity to do this on your own, we can't even transfer the house out of your name because chances are your house is worth more than $15,000. So having that limited gifting language in there really limits what we're able to do from a planning perspective. So you really want that unlimited, unlimited gift language in there. Something else that we use often when we're talking about planning for long-term care are irrevocable trusts. Now, a lot of powers of attorney that we see, they allow for the creation of trusts. Unfortunately, the state of Pennsylvania interprets that as only revocable trusts. And when we're talking about planning for long-term care, usually it always needs to be an irrevocable trust. Only irrevocable trusts offer protection against creditors like the state or the nursing home. So we really like to see that irrevocable trust language in your power of attorney you may or may not need that in the future, but at least if it's in there, this gives you options. And then a couple other things that might need to be, or might be important is if the creation of a special needs trust, like if one of your loved ones is on a disability or is receiving government benefits, it might be necessary for a special needs trust to be created on their behalf. And also digital assets. Those should be covered in your power of attorney as well. I will tell you that there is actually um, legislation in place right now that authorizes, automatically authorizes your power of attorney to be able to deal with digital assets like 
email accounts, online banking, social media accounts, but it's still good to have in your power of attorney just to make sure that nothing's missed. So that's my spiel on the financial power of attorney and what needs to be in there. I will tell you all that the laws changed in about 2014 to 2015. And the most important thing that you should take away from this is now the law says that if it's not spelled out in that power of attorney that your agent can do something on your behalf, then they're not allowed to do it. So this has made our documents a lot longer. Our financial power of attorney alone is about 19 to 20 pages, just to give you an idea. We really want to make sure that your power of attorney is able to do whatever they need to on your behalf. So it's definitely a good idea to have those, those documents reviewed from time to time. The next power of attorney is the healthcare power of attorney. Now, it's important that you understand that when it comes to these healthcare decisions and these healthcare documents, you have the right to make your own healthcare choices regardless of what these documents say. These documents really only kick in if you're not able to make those healthcare decisions yourself. And even if you can't verbally state what those healthcare decisions are, if you can blink your eyes or squeeze someone's hand to let them know what your healthcare decisions are, you still have the right to make those decisions. But if at some point in time, the doctors determine that you're not able to make your own decisions, that's when these, these documents would be really helpful. And the healthcare power of attorney is more of a generalized document. This authorizes your agent or your power of attorney to make decisions like who your doctors would be, what hospital or facility you can be treated at, and it's HIPAA compliant. So they're able to talk to your doctors and access medical records. The next document is the mental health power of attorney. This is very similar to that, that healthcare power of attorney, but obviously this is specific to any mental health treatment you would have, you would need. This is great if you have a history of mental illness and it's also good in, ca in case you would end up with a diagnosis of dementia. So this authorizes your power of attorney to make decisions like who your mental health doctors would be, what mental health facilities you can be treated at. But the really important aspect to this is this document addresses treatments that are specific to mental illnesses. And I always use the example of dementia. Dementia does not, most forms of dementia do not have a cure. So all we have are certain labs, studies, medicinal trials, things like that to try to slow the progression of the disease over time. A lot of those methods of treatment are not necessarily proven right now. So they're sort of in a gray area until they are proven down the road. This mental health power of attorney allows your agent to, to decide whether or not you should be allowed uh, those types of treatments those, those that are in that gray area that I just talked about. Those, just having a regular healthcare power of attorney does not allow your agent to be able to say yes or no to these types of treatments. You have to have this document here, okay? This is a newer document in Pennsylvania. I believe it's about five years old. And it's actually, this is such a hot topic. This document actually automatically expires two years after you sign it. So you have to re-sign that document every two years. Then the last power of attorney we're gonna talk about is the living will. And I, there's, we get a lot of questions about this document. Um, I think a lot of people don't really understand when it applies. This document really only applies in limited situations. So the document only applies if the doctors are saying you're in a permanent coma, a permanent vegetative state, or you have a terminal condition. So you have about six months or less to live and you're unable to make your own decisions at that point in time. So what our standard living will says is if you find yourself in one of those end of life situations where basically the doctors are saying there's no hope of recovery, standard document says that you don't want any artificial life sustaining measures taken. You don't want things like breathing machines, feeding tubes, dialysis, chemo, any of those major forms of treatment. What we do typically recommend though, is that you at least allow for artificial hydration so that you can receive water through an IV so you can get pain relieving drugs so that you're comfortable and not suffering. That's the one recommendation we have as far as whether or not you receive the other forms of treatment. It's, it's really personal. You know, even though our standard document says one thing, you know, these are very personal decisions and we could, we could tweak that to whatever, you know, your desires and wishes are. The last thing I want to mention about the living will is our living will typically includes a provision for dementia because dementia is not considered a terminal condition in Pennsylvania. So what that provision usually says is if I'm diagnosed with a form of dementia and it reaches those late stages where basically you can't swallow on your own, 
you're okay with not having a feeding tube inserted at that time. So just something else to think about. So let's talk next about who should be your power of attorney. I keep saying agent as well. They're interchangeable. Your agent is your power of attorney. And I think this is an easy choice for some families, um, but other uh, we see quite a few clients that really just aren't sure who to appoint as their power of attorney. Um, a lot of, if, if you're married, a lot of times it's your spouse, um, but it could be children. It could be nieces, nephews, siblings. It could be a family member. It could be a really close friend. You can actually appoint multiple people um, and you could force them to work together. Or you could say, you know, whoever's available, they can act individually. What we find a lot of times now is that children don't necessarily live close by. We see more often than not that actually children are in all four corners of the country. So it might make more sense to say, you know, I appoint my three children, but whoever's available, they can act on my behalf. Now it's important that they're able to get along for the most part. So they're not doing different things to contradict each other. What I would not recommend is, you know, if you have five children, I wouldn't appoint them all jointly because chances are they'll never be able to uh, make a decision at any point in time. But really we have flexibility to make that look however you'd like it to be. And at the end of the day, we really, we really suggest that you appoint somebody that you trust, you know, somebody that's responsible. Um, they might have skill in that certain area. So you can actually appoint um, pe different people on your powers of attorney. If you have someone who it has more of a healthcare background, you could appoint that person in charge of your healthcare decisions. And if you have somebody who has more of a banking or a financial background, you could appoint that person for your financial documents. So like I said, lots of flexibility as far as who you can appoint in these documents. It's really important that you review these documents from time to time with an attorney. We always recommend that you review these documents with an elder law attorney because it's the elder law attorneys that are really going to be helping you with a lot of those second half of life decisions. You know, we walk you through um, the point where when you're talking about retirement, you know, and make sure that everything's good to go as far as retiring. We're the ones that you talk to when you're starting to think about, you know, what if I need long term care? And then we're also the ones that are there, you know, if you would pass away or you're planning, you know, for your death. So we really help, help you with a lot of those second half of life decisions. So it's really important that you have that kind of advice when you're reviewing these documents. It's also impo important that you have succession in these documents. You, we always recommend having backups. You know, if you appoint your spouse in these powers of attorney, have, have a backup in case your spouse isn't able to act as your power of attorney. And you want to make sure that these people are still the best people that you can have appointed in, in the documents themselves. Now we've talked a lot about powers of attorney. Powers of attorney are only in place while you're living. And then once you pass away, the powers of attorney are basically null and void. It's your will that we're looking at. And then trusts are typically in place while you're living and then a little bit after death. Most people understand that your last will and testament says where you want your assets to go when you pass away. You also appoint what's called an executor or a personal representative who's basically going to be in charge of your estate. They're gonna make sure that all your debts and expenses are paid and that your beneficiaries receive what, whatever it is that you want them to receive. A couple other things that your will can do is if you have any minor children and something should happen to you and the children's other parent, you can actually appoint what's called a testamentary guardian. This is the way that you can tell the courts who you'd like to take care of your minor children if something happened to the parents, to you and your, your spouse or you and the children's other parent. Also, if any of your beneficiaries are minors, legally we can't have an inheritance just go directly to minor children. So a lot of times what we do is we appoint what's called a custodian, somebody to basically monitor the inheritance that the minor child would receive until they reach a certain age. It has to be at least age 18. The majority of our clients actually don't want that child to receive the inheritance until age 25, just because they feel that they're going to be a little more responsible at that point. A couple things that it's really important that, you're, that your will have, it should be self-proving, which means that you signed the will in front of two witnesses and a notary, so three separate people there. If you don't have a will that's self-proving, what happens is when you pass away, 
we have to track down the people who were present when you signed the will. If you signed your will 20 years ago, it's, it's going to be very difficult for us to track those people down if they're still living. So it's much easier just to make it self-proving so that that doesn't have to be done. And also, we recommend what's called a bypass clause. So if you're married, what the bypass clause says is, if I pass away, everything goes to my spouse. But if my spouse is institutionalized in a, in a nursing home and is on government benefits, I want to bypass that spouse. So not everything goes straight to the nursing home. Trust me, some, some still goes to the, to the home, but not everything. Now, keep in mind with that type of a clause, there is what's called a spousal election, which means that uh, you can never completely disinherit your spouse in Pennsylvania, not that any of you on here would want to do so, but that your spouse is always entitled to at least one third of your estate. So if we would use that bypass clause, one third would still be due to the spouse, which would eventually go to the nursing home. But this does protect two thirds of your estate then to, to pass on to your next level beneficiaries, whether that's your children, nieces and nephews, whoever that would be. Keep in mind that not everything passes according to what your will says. So if you have any accounts that have beneficiary designations on them, like life insurance policies, retirement accounts, anything like that, those accounts will go to whoever the beneficiaries are designated on those accounts. Same thing if you have like an investment account that has a transfer on death designation or a payable on death designation, those accounts will go directly to whoever the, the designation is on that account, regardless of what your will says. So it's a good idea from time to time to check those beneficiaries. Real estate always wor works a little bit differently. It really depends on what the deed says. So if you hold property with your spouse, chances are you hold that as what's called a tenancy by the entireties. Your, your deed doesn't even have to say that. That's, that's typically just legally how you hold it. That means if one of you would pass away, the property automatically gets transferred 100% to the surviving spouse. You don't even need a new deed at that point in time. Now, if you hold property with somebody else other than your spouse and you hold that as what's called a joint tenancy with the right of survivorship, it works the same way. If one of you were to pass away, the property passes 100% to the survivor. Now, if you hold property as what's called a tenancy in common, if you were to pass away, your share passes according to what your will says. So it's really important to look at what your deed says and figure out how you hold property if that's a, if that's a concern of yours. Again, it's really important to check on the beneficiaries that you have on accounts. I, I can't tell you how many times Kristen and I have actually looked at different policies with clients. And we've actually had a client who had a beneficiary on his account and didn't even know who the person was. Somehow the information was transferred completely inaccurately. He didn't even know who the beneficiary was on his account. Um, it was a person he never even saw the name before. So definitely check on those beneficiary designations from time to time, just to make sure that things get transferred the way they're supposed to be. Names are spelled accurately. That's really important. So now I'm going to, I'm turning it over to Kristen. She's going to talk more about the long-term care planning aspect of what we do at our office. Great. Thanks, Jenna. So we've already gave a lot of information and um, Jenna and I never mean to overwhelm or um, make anybody feel stressed out about this, but we also feel like it's really important to educate and provide the information. So Jenna did a really thorough review of the really important estate planning documents that everyone must have. So what I'm going to talk about next is what happens if you get sick and need some type of care? What are your options for care? What does that look like? Um, and what you can do to qualify for benefits. So right now in Pennsylvania, skilled nursing home costs almost $11,000 a month on average. Um, some are a little bit lower, some are a little bit higher. But based on the average, long-term care in Pennsylvania costs over $128,000 a year. So you can see why it's so important to make sure you have a plan in place so you don't exhaust your entire life savings when you might not necessarily have to. So before we talk about how you pay for care, it's really important to know what type of care options are available. I always think this is a really important component to our presentations because most people don't actually realize 
there's options out there. So let's start with in-home care. Most of us want to stay home no matter what. And I absolutely think that's fantastic as long as it's safe and it makes sense. So when we're looking at in-home care, one of your options to help pay for that is private paying. So there are a lot of agencies out there that you can hire and they will send caregivers into your home to do a variety of different tasks. Most of the time, those tasks are non-medical related, so more like helping with your activities of daily living, like bathing, dressing, grooming, toileting, um, meal preparation, maybe some respite, things like that. But on average, in our areas, it's about $25 an hour to pay an agency to provide care. So that can add up really quickly, depending on how much care you need. Some people only need very minimal, so that makes sense. You can also hire somebody that you know to pay, provide care. It doesn't have to be through an agency. It can be a family member. It can be a neighbor, a friend, somebody from church. That is also a really good option. Generally, it's a lot less costly when you're hiring somebody not through an agency. One thing I will mention, if you are hiring, paying for somebody out of your pocket that's not through an agency, or you're thinking that that might be an option for you down the road, it's really important to have some sort of legal contract in place when you employ that individual. And it, it's definitely helpful as far as like liability issues, but really why we say it's the most beneficial is if you do need Medicaid benefits down the road for in-home care or nursing home care, if you were paying somebody out of your pocket and do not have a legal contract in place, it could actually affect your Medicaid benefits because it could be viewed as a gift. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, but that's just one simple strategy that we always suggest putting in place if you're private paying for in-home care, not through an agency. Now, if you're private paying for care and maybe you need some more or you're looking at different options, where do you turn? Well, I'll tell you, we are really lucky that we have some wonderful area agencies on aging throughout um, you know, central Pennsylvania. We're really lucky. They, have, they do a really good job and they're really good advocates for um, the, their clients and others in the communities. There are a variety of options available with the, within the area agency on aging as far as services. So things like Meals on Wheels, um, other options maybe for some personal care. Um, so if you're looking for what is available, that's a great place to start. Now, a lot of the programs at the Area Agency on Aging, they're all designed to keep people home, but a lot of them don't provide, you know, real intensive amount of care. But there is one program called the Waiver Program. Um, this, is what, this is actually what I used to do when I worked for the Area Agency on Aging. Now that was about 10 years ago, so it was a really long time and the program's changed so much since then. The Waiver Program was designed as a program to keep individuals home that would otherwise need the highest level of nursing home care, like that skilled nursing home care. So it can provide really intensive in-home care. It could be maybe five hours a day, maybe six, seven, eight, nine, ten. It will not pay for 24 hours a day of care, um, but it can really provide a lot of, um, you know, those services because maybe your your husband needs some respite or needs some additional help because he can't do it. Maybe your child, you're living with your child, your child's living with you, and they have to go to work during the day. It can be a great option to keep for you to be able to stay home. Again, it doesn't provide medical services, but it can provide those homemakers to come in and help. I'm gonna come back to this program in a little bit when we're talking about Medicaid qualifications because it is a Medicaid program. And there are um, a lot of different strategies that we can implement to help you get qualified for that program, even if you don't meet the income or asset threshold. So we'll circle back around to that. Now, if you're at home, 
but maybe you need to get out of your home for different reasons. Maybe because your daughter's working and you, you know, the caregivers aren't enough, or maybe you just need some socialization. There are adult daycare centers and they're a life program, which is essentially set up designed like an adult daycare center. These are really great for individuals that can still get out of their home, but otherwise need a lot of care. There's generally medical staff on duty there that are going to be able to, to check you every day or whenever you're there to make sure you know health-wise everything's going okay. Plus, it's really important for that socialization, getting out of your house. You don't feel as isolated, so we can hopefully avoid depression, anxiety, other things like that. So that's a really great option. Um, in State College, there are a few options for adult daycares. Outside in the, some of the surrounding communities, though, there's very limited options or no options. So that's something that's very specific to where you're located at, if it makes sense or not. Now, at times, we need to um, bump up and we might need some sort of care in a facility. That can look a lot of different ways. The lowest level of care really is actually independent living. So independent living really is um, part of uh, a bigger community that offers other levels of care. Sometimes we see spouses um, move into independent living when their husband or wife is in the same community but needs a little bit more care. Um, so they're kind of gradually going into that. Independent living is really just, you're living there. They're not gonna provide any type of services. Maybe you can you know, opt into the meals or help with your medications, but really it's not gonna be anything else. It's really just living there. Um, but personal care home and senior living facilities, that's really the next step up. So this used to be clumped in with the assisted livings. Um, Pennsylvania's kind of got away from that term and it really has to do with funding. Um, so right now, personal care homes, senior living communities are that option if you just need a little bit of help. So you move into the community, you have your own room or maybe you're sharing a room depending on what, you're, what that looks like for you financially. And then you, they're gonna provide your meals, you're gonna help out with medications. They can also help with things such as personal care. Now, that can look a lot of different ways. Some people don't need help with that when they move into a personal care home, but some actually need quite a bit of help with that. So that's how they determine how they charge for that, that level of care is really essentially on how much care you need. Personal care homes in our area can range anywhere from about $3,500 a month. I've seen them up to $9,000 a month. And that, that higher end would be for somebody that maybe is in like the memory care unit in that personal care home. So really needing a lot of care. We do also have some specific memory care units within our community. So this is just a unit that does nothing except, except individuals with memory that need that memory care support. So that's a really good option. I absolutely love these communities because I, I think it's, they, they can focus on nothing but the individuals that are living there that have the memory issues. So I think that's a really great service. Um, and then we have skilled nursing homes. So skilled nursing homes are the highest level of care. So these are for individuals who their cognition had, they have, you know, cognitive impairments that they need that highest level of care because maybe they're a wandering risk or they have medical issues that require that level of care. Maybe they're having falls or, you know, health-wise they're really compromised. We also are lucky enough in our area to have some continuing care retirement communities. So these are communities that might encompass all of these levels of care. So once you move in, no matter what the level of care is, you can age in place, which is so important. So you might have to move to another building, but you're, you're within that same community and with, with those same people. Now, if you're considering a continuing care retirement community, I will say they are fantastic, but they all work really different. Some of them have a buy-in, so you have to put a large sum of money up front before you can even walk in the door, and then you have a monthly rent on top of that. Some of them don't have that buy-in, so everyone works a little bit different, so just make sure if you're thinking about that, that you're really looking into the options and to make sure it works for you. So how do you pay for long-term care? And this is really um, important to talk about and it's really confusing. 
So of course you can pay for your care out, out of your own pocket, private pay. Like I mentioned, in-home care is about $25 an hour through an agency. Um, skilled nursing home care can be up to about $11,000 a month. Some people have long-term care insurance. Long-term care insurance is a great option. So um, there's different types of policies. It's important to know if you do have a policy, what does it say? What is the daily benefit? What is the maximum benefit? What levels of care does it provide or cover? So it's, it's always hard when someone comes in and meets with us and they say, wow, this long-term care insurance, it's going to you know, pay for my wife's in-home care. When we look at it, he's paid in it for all this year thinking, all these years thinking that it's gonna cover in-home care and it actually doesn't. It only includes facility care. So making sure you know what that policy actually covers is really great. Now, it's also important, as I mentioned, to look at the daily benefits. So if you bought the policy years ago, it probably covers maybe $100 a day of care. Well, right now the average cost of daily care is about $350. So there's definitely still gonna be a shortfall, but that long-term care insurance is certainly helpful and it will work hand in hand with any planning that we would help you with. There's newer long-term care insurance policies. Um, they finally kind of got up and running with um, the, the new ways to do things and what they look like is it provides like a living needs benefit so if you need it during your life it's available however if you never need it but and then you pass away at that point in time it has a death benefit that would pay your beneficiaries so that's a really great option if you're a veteran or your spouse is a veteran or you are a widow of a veteran there are benefits that could be available through the Veterans Administration. They, um, it won't pay for all of your care most likely, but it could supplement up to maybe $2,000 a month to help pay for your care. As far as Medicare goes, Medicare is usually just a short-term fix. Um, it's really only for um, paying for short-term care. Medicare will typically not cover long-term care. Um, it usually only pays for the first uh, 100 days, up to the first 100 days, as far as um, long-term care goes. And to be honest, what we see in our office is usually the Medicare will only cover the first 20 days. That's, you, that's very, very rarely do we see more than 20 days that Medicare will actually pay for. Now, Medicaid is really the primary source of paying for long-term care. Medicaid is really what we deal primarily with at our office. Before we jump into how Medicaid works, what does it cover and what does it not cover? So Medicaid can pay for nursing home care, that highest level of care, and it can also pay for services under the waiver program for the in-home care. Right now in Pennsylvania, it's not paying for personal care homes, senior living, or any other types of in-home care. So how does Medicaid work? So Medicaid is an impoverishment program. And you might be thinking, well, why are we even talking about this? I would never qualify for Medicaid to help pay for my care. The truth is almost everybody can actually qualify for Medicaid to help pay for their care. Now, everybody's situation is different, but our job is to work with you to protect your assets for your spouse or your, your legacy, your children, grandchildren, whoever that may be. Um, I feel really passionate about making sure the spouse that doesn't need care is never fear, fearful of becoming impoverished, losing their house, losing their income, not being able to live their life. That's really important to me. So I always think, you know, in a spousal situation, if, you're, if your husband or wife needs care, you need to work with an elder law attorney right away because the quicker that you jump into action, the more that you can protect for your spouse. Now, so what's countable, what's available for nursing home care, what's not available, what does Medicaid look at as far as qualification? Well, whether you're a single applicant or you're married, pretty much all assets are available. This includes any type of bank accounts, CDs, investment accounts, brokerage accounts, life insurance policies that have a cash value. So that cash value is available for care. And I think that's always really scary because a lot of times the cash value, what you would get if you, you cashed in right now is much lower than that death benefit. So we need to protect that death benefit. 
Um, there's a couple exceptions to this. Um, what's not countable? So retirement accounts of the spouse that doesn't need care. So if I need care and I have an IRA, it's available for my care. I'm going to have to um, cash that in, pay taxes on it and use it for my care. But if my husband needs care, my IRA isn't available for his care. So it's protected. Now we have to take a, a next step. You know, who's the beneficiary? Does that still make sense? Because if I pass away first, we don't want to just go right to the nursing home. So there's a lot of layers to kind of figure that out to see, see what makes the most sense. But most, uh, almost everything is available. So even if, again, I have a bank account, a checking account in my name, my husband needs care, that checking account's available for his care. Doesn't matter how it's titled. So it's really important to make sure that you have a plan in place in the event you do get sick. Now, real estate gets a little tricky. Um, Jenna talked a little bit about that earlier. Um, so your primary residence, so your house, if you need Medicaid to help pay for in-home or nursing home care, your house is exempt. The state can't take it or count it as an asset during your life. However, after you pass away, the state of Pennsylvania will place a, an estate recovery claim against that property to the extent they've paid for your care. Now, if there's a surviving spouse, they will not kick that surviving spouse out, but the claim will stay until both spouses pass away and they will come back. Pennsylvania is very poor, so they will come back and claim in any way they possibly can. There are strategies that we can implement even if you are already needing care or need care right now to help protect that spouse. But I have to say, it all goes back to those powers of attorney that Jenna mentioned early, earlier, especially that financial power of attorney. A lot of times we get in a situation where somebody needs care now, they come to us and we're like, great, here's this plan. Oh, but you don't have capacity and your power of attorney is not good enough. So then we have to look at guardianships and stuff like that or not doing anything. So, um, you know, making sure you're, you have good powers of attorney in place is really important. As I mentioned, even if you already need care, you're already in care, you moved in a nursing home, you, you need help qualifying for the waiver program, you can still protect assets. Now, generally speaking, you can protect more and put a better plan in place if you plan before the crisis, but there's still options even if you've waited. Um, so protecting the spouse. So there's um, a couple different ways this can look. And you know we could give you a lot of different scenarios, but realistically, everybody's plan that comes into our office looks very different. So there might be some similarities, but the plan is different because everybody has different goals. Everybody's situation looks a little bit different, but the one thing that we really want to make sure is the spouse that doesn't need care is taken care of. So there's strategies that we can implement at the time of care, that care is needed. If one spouse is in a nursing home or needs in-home care that we can protect the um, everything, essentially everything for the spouse that doesn't need care while getting the spouse in the facility qualified for Medicaid immediately. So there's things that we can do to get immediate qualification while protecting all the assets. Um, before we jump into the five-year look back. So when we're talking about in-home care, I always think it's really important to talk about, you know, with the waiver program. So as I mentioned a few moments ago, the waiver program is designed to keep people in home that would otherwise need that highest level of care and by providing services. So it is a Medicaid program and we have to follow those strict income and asset guidelines, which um, I didn't mention those before, but the income um, right now the magic number is $2,349 a month for gross income. So when we talk about income, when you're in a nursing home, it matters, but it doesn't really matter. But if you want to qualify for the waiver program at home, income really does matter. So back when I used to work at the Area Agency on Aging during the program, if someone called and their gross income was over $2,349 a month, I'd have to say, I'm sorry, you don't qualify for the program. However, over the last couple years, um, we've been able to figure out strategies to kind of get around that. Um, it's really kind of complicated and it's essentially getting you qualified for a different category of Medicaid. <laughs> 
And there's, um, there's extra steps that go into it that we either have to do on a monthly basis or a six month basis, but it is possible. So it's even if you think that you're, you don't qualify because of your income for the waiver program, please know that there are options available. Sometimes they don't make sense, but a lot of times they do. So there's things that we can still do. Same goes as far as assets. So the asset threshold for the waiver program is $8,000. So the applicant themselves cannot have any more than $8,000 in assets in their name. So even if you have $100,000 in assets in your names, there are strategies that we can implement right now to get you qualified for Medicaid while protecting some or all of that. So just know there are options out there if there are services that you need that we can help you navigate through that. <clears throat> But let's talk about the five-year look back because that's always something that you know people have questions about. Um, there's a lot of misunderstanding about how it looks. So the five-year look back is the five years prior to you qualifying for Medicaid or applying for Medicaid. So if I'm moving into a nursing home today or applying for the waiver program today and I um, made gifts within the last five years, it doesn't mean I'm not going to qualify for care for five years, it just means that there's going to be a period of ineligibility issue. So how we determine that period of ineligibility is by the app, taking the average cost of nursing home care in Pennsylvania, which is $10,732. And for every $10,732 that you give away, it's one month the state of Pennsylvania will not pay for your nursing home care. So if I give away $10,732 today, need, move into a nursing home tomorrow, Medicaid will not pay for my care for one month. So that's how they figure that out. Now I will say up at the top here, you see $500 is highlighted. That's the gifting rules for Medicaid. So a gift is anything over $500 a month. And that's not per person. You can't, if you have four kids, you can't give them each $500 a month for Medicaid, $500 total. And some of you might be thinking, wait, I thought it was like 12,000 or I thought it was 15,000. Those are tax gifting rules. Medicaid, it's anything over $500 a month is um, creates a penalty for Medicaid. Let me give you an example of how that works. So you have a house and the fair market value is $100,000. Within, you need skill care within five years after you made the gift. So you give your ha the house, let's say, like gave your house away and then you need nursing home care within five years. We take the value of the gift, $100,000, divide it by the average cost of care, and that's 9.3 months the state of Pennsylvania would not pay for your in-home care or nursing home care. So why, why that's really important for me to be able to give that example. Let me run you through a couple of different scenarios. So we have a situation where um, we gifted our house and now we need care and we don't have any other money, any other assets. We have a bank account with like $200 in it. And so we're trying to get to a nursing home. I don't know if any of you have had any experience recently with nursing homes, but they are, even before COVID, <laughs> they were, you know, had waiting lists. It was really hard to get in. So when the application asks if you made gifts and you said yes, they're going to automatically put you at the bottom of the list because they want to make sure they're a business. They want to make sure they're getting paid. So now the other situation is you've made this gift and you have enough money to pay for nine months in the nursing home. So that'd be about $90,000. So that's an option that protects the gift. So there's things that could happen if you make gifts and you don't really understand the repercussions of that. Um, so don't let me scare you though. Jen and I make gifts every single day with our clients. We make a lot of gifts. That's what we do, but we do it very strategic and in a planned way because we never know who's going to need care or when they're going to need care. So along with that, a lot of times people ask, well, can't I just give my asset when I give the assets away, can I just give them to my kids? And legally, sure you can, but we don't recommend it. And we really don't do outright gifting because there's a lot of risks. One, it still creates a Medicaid and eligibility period, but also because of what we call the four Ds, divorce, debt, disability, and death. So let's say I gave my house to my son and he gets divorced. Well, I hope I like his wife and I hope she's nice because now she could own half of the house give my house to my son and he has creditors. Well, now that's available to his creditors. Give my house to my son and he becomes disabled and needs benefits. He might not qualify for the services he needs. 
Or if I give my house to my son, he passes away. What happens to it then? What does his will say? Does he have a will? I also have to mention there is a filial responsibility act in Pennsylvania that says that the nursing homes can actually sue your children for, for non-payment. So it doesn't even matter if you're power of attorney or not. There have been cases in Pennsylvania where nursing homes have su successfully sued children because they are financially able to support their parents. So um, we would never want to put your child in that position. And most of our clients wouldn't want to put their, 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 their children, I'm sorry, in, in that position either. So when we talk about, you know, transferring, you know, how do we do that? And we're not going to dive really too much into this today, but um, we use irrevocable trust when we gift because that's really the best way, a best way to protect, you know, tuck those assets aside for you during your life, but also make sure that it gets to your beneficiaries after you pass away. So it's the best plan um, to make sure that, you know, all your wishes are um, granted and we're doing things in a very nice manner for you. So again, how can you protect your assets? Well, we can use an irrevocable trust if that's what makes sense for you. Um, another thing I use most often in my situations where I'm working with families in nursing homes right now, we're using Med Medicaid compliant annuities. It's a very, very specific annuity that we can use. Most often we're using this in a situation where it's a spousal situation where one needs care and one doesn't because we can, we can um, protect everything using a Medicaid compliant annuity. Irrevocable funeral, home, funeral accounts are, are a good way to tuck aside assets and qualify for benefits. Home modifications, um, one vehicle is an allowable expense. So if you have two vehicles, you can trade them in and purchase a nice vehicle. There's lots of different ways. These are just a very few examples of what you can actually do to protect your assets while qualifying for benefits. <clears throat> Now, I know we've thrown a ton of information at you today, and um, Jenna and I could talk to you guys about this all day long because there's so many different scenarios and so many different ways that this can look, um, but we also don't want to make this too overwhelming, um, but we want you to know that there's options out there, and um, you know, it's really good as we enter into our second half of life that we're working with a law firm that does that. That's all they do. You know, we don't dabble in things like divorce or real estate or things like that. We focus on this every single day so we can make sure we're doing a really good job for you. We know how this works. I work with the Pennsylvania Department of Human Services, the County Assistance Office every single day. I deal with them every day. We know how these benefits work. We know what your options are. Um, so it's really important to make sure that you have a law firm on your side that can help you through all the planning that may be needed through your second half of life. At our office, we work together as a team to make sure we're doing a really good job. Um, we also right now, if you're thinking about, you, you know, you'd like to have a little more information, um, we actually have a second half of life podcast that we started through COVID. So one, you know, we'll take what we can with wins with COVID. We've um, been able to do a lot more things um, online. So we have a lot of different podcasts on our website. Um, we have a lot of articles on our website. Our website is actually just like a wealth of knowledge. So if you are thinking about, you know, you want to learn some more, or learn about different topics, our podcasts are there. Our website has a lot of information. It's all there. Because again, we feel like it's really important to educate about what options there are. <clears throat>